and you took that into a record business. Jimmy's one of those guys that if you think you killed him, you better go back and shoot him again because he'll get up. <laughs> wow, man. I got a chance to watch this documentary see a series called The Defiant Ones. That's premiering Sunday, July 9th, 9 p.m. on HBO. Four different episodes. And it takes you inside uh, the life and times of one of the most celebrated music people. I won't even give him a particular title because he's a music person. Mm -hmm. You know, whether he's producing music for the likes of Tom Petty, Patti Smith, Iggy Azalea, Bruce Springsteen, Lady Gaga, U2, wow. Gwen Stefani. I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on. Or rather, he's the brainchild behind Beats headphones or this um, monumental deal that they struck up with Apple. Or just somebody who's looking towards the future and how we can make through technology um, culture more accessible uh, to a global population. Um, everything I've watched him do, he has done it with extreme amounts of passion. There's a lot that I know and there's a lot that I don't know. And there's a lot you don't know that you will find out in the Defiant Ones. He's here with us, founder of Interscope Records. Give it up for Jimmy Iovine. Ladies Woo! and gentlemen, Jimmy Iovine. Nice to be here. Good to have you, man. Here, man, you know, look at the headphones we have, Jimmy. <laughs> You want to put them on? Look Dang. at that. Well, they got a I, they got a count of those suckers. Man. Yeah, you know right. I mean? <laughs> <laughs> wow, well, man. I'm gonna, put, I'm gonna go with my hat. You gonna go with the hat, okay. man? I do the hat there thing too, go. man. All right. Um, <laughs> we had Alan Hughes up here yesterday, um, and I, I, I you know, I, what I want to ask you the defiant ones. Why, why now? What, what, why was it so important to tell these stories? Well, you know, they. What happened was I was thinking about doing something on Interscope. Uh, with HBO, you know, a documentary, because I felt that the 90s at Interscope was really a unique time. And uh -huh. it was the only time, the only reason to do something in a documentary is that there's something unique happening, you know, just, and I felt that that was a real moment in popular culture. And Alan uh, wanted to do something with Dre, and I never thought he'd get Dre to do anything, you know, so I didn't know about that. He approached HBO, and then, HBO said, well, we're talking to Jimmy. And then Alan came up with this thing. And he said, you know, the real story is your relationship with Dre and how that you guys got to there and then stayed together through some of the most difficult circumstances in the, uh, and probably in the history of entertainment yeah. as far as difficult, uh -huh. you know, complex, difficult problems, uh -huh. you know, uh, real life issues. And um, so... I said no for about two years because I'm like, okay, why am I doing this? And then finally, Alan got me to call Dre about it and Dre was willing to do it. And the fact that Dr. Dre was willing to talk, uh -huh. I said, I, I can't not let this happen. Yeah. You know, yeah. and uh, so I went along with it and, you know, it came, you know, you've seen it. It's a, it's a, it's a different look, you know. I thought it was done extremely well. I thought um it was very honest. I mean, there was a lot of stories. Interscope, you know, really catapulted to its success um, through the signing of Death Row Records, Dr. Dre, and, you know, Suge Knight. Would you, is that correct? Yeah. Suge, Suge and Dre, they came in to play me the chronic. You know, John McClain brought them in. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't know a lot about hip-hop, you know, and but I came from a rock world, really, and... Dre played me the chronic, and when I heard the sound of it, because I didn't really understand the production on hip hop, I, I didn't understand. I knew Hank Shockley, I knew a bunch of those guys, but I didn't really understand what they were doing. And and the idea of working with a subwoofer, the whole thing was, uh -huh. you know, it, it just I didn't grasp it. And when I heard J uh, Dre do it, it sounded like it sounded like something between like. When I first heard Sgt. Pepper, when I first heard Pink Floyd, it was like, mm -hmm. or Phil Spector, anybody who broke ground sonically. And I said, this guy's broken ground here. I mean, if he can, it, this 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 guy really can do something great. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and he, it, he actually did. What, he, what I was listening to was great. But yeah, that's why I did it. You know, and I felt that, okay. And yeah, I didn't think it was going to take three or four years. Mm -hmm. You know, Alan did an incredible job. And it is honest. It is honest because why do it? You know, why, I, you know, why do it if it's not going to be the truth? Did you find, like, um, you know, in retrospect, when you look back at those years, and we'll walk it up to now, um, 
you know, Death Row, uh, the, the messaging that it was perpetuating at that time to us was like, man, I don't see nothing wrong with it. They're talking about what we see on the streets every single day. Uh, but to a lot of folks, not everybody in the black community, at least, felt like this messaging was healthy for the community. Did you at any time listen to some of the music and go, hey, fellas, you know, this might be pushing it too far? Well, you see, I come from a background mm-hmm. of where artists are are allowed to create anything they want to create. That was my history. That's all I knew. Um, I've seen Lennon go through things. I've seen... Richard Nixon trying to throw John out of the country uh, based on what he was saying. Uh Um, And my responsibility as a record executive was to just get music out, whether it was U2's music or Death Row's music or Pac. I mean, you know, you took, it's it's a very complex issue, you know, that I've dealt with on certain levels and I've had conversations about. But, if that's Dre and Snoop's truth, I'm, I've, I, I, what am I supposed to do? I'm, yeah. I don't know. I, 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 I don't. Um, I always felt that artists should be able to express themselves, and I still feel that way. You still feel that way. Um, uh, Jimmy Iovine is here. We're talking about the defiant ones. I'm asking you about this because I think it was the third episode. I want to say with Death Row, we start seeing more about what was going on and and Death Row. And the whole time I'm looking, I'm like, damn, why didn't could Jimmy have, who could have, like in retrospect, when you look at it, because, you know, ultimately we, we don't have Pac no more. A lot of dudes were getting beat up. It was a lot of violence inside of Death Row. Yep. And I know Death Row was being fueled by Interscope, you know, primarily Bank Road. Did you ever, like, feel like in retrospect, felt like, man, what could I have done differently? So that I could Well, you it? always do. Of course yeah. you do. And it, it, it just got so, first of all, no one's doing this stuff. In your house, you know, yeah. I would have sugar the guys out to my house all the time, mm-hmm. saying to them things like, "Okay, I don't understand this. I don't understand these issues because every criminal I've ever met in my life mm-hmm. or saw in a movie wanted to be a legitimate businessman. Mm-hmm. You guys are the ultimate legitimate businessmen, earning tens of millions of dollars a month." Mm-hmm. What's with all the noise, you know? And it just, it just got out of hand, and yeah. we couldn't, as you see in that episode, we couldn't, we couldn't put a lid on it. First of all, we didn't know. Uh-huh. I wasn't somebody that walk in my office and say, you know, let's, this is what's going on. Uh-huh. I hadn't, and it was mostly violence. Yeah, it was mostly inner fightings with uh, two camps or each other. There was nobody robbing banks. There was nobody selling drugs. There was, it was violence, uh-huh. which was, I don't know. I don't know what, uh, at that moment, they were earning, selling millions and millions of albums. Uh-huh. So what do you do? You, I don't know. I believed in Dre. Yeah. I believe in Dr. Dre, period. Yeah. You tried to convince Dre? Of staying with Death Row for a minute? Absolutely. Yeah, that came out in the Defiant Ones? Absolutely. And, and Dre was like, hell no? Or No, <laughs> no, no, not at all. Uh, Suge came to me and said, um, we want Dre out. Uh-huh. And I said, Dre, you know, I said, first of all, I said, what do you want me to do? How am I supposed to get involved in your business? Remember, they own the record company. Okay. Interscope did not own Death Row. Okay. We were their distributor. And I made that deal. I wanted this hip hop company to own its own masters and own everything. Uh And that's from the very beginning. So they own this. So how am I supposed to tell them that they have to break up? But these are not children. Yeah. You know, and uh, they're very successful. So there is no grown up and sort of man okay. involved. Yeah, that's in what that. I'm trying to find out. I know, no, you I know. know what I mean? Like was, yeah. were, you, were you the head in charge? No. Well but, but, I was. I was in charge of Interscope. Yeah. Uh but Suge wanted to Dre out of death row. Mm-hmm. And and I said, um, I think that's a mistake. And mm-hmm. then Suge finally said it enough times that I went to Dre. I said, Dre, I don't know where you sit on this because I didn't know what was going on. I found out what was going on in the studio mm-hmm. in the movie Compton. <laughs> Oh, by watching wow. the movie? That's yes. how you found out? Absolutely. Okay. How would I you know, how would anybody know? You think yeah. they're gonna show me of all people yeah. what the hell that people are getting beat up and stuff like that? Mm-hmm. No one 
tells anybody anything. But you heard about it, though. You no, must have heard. You didn't hear anything. Absolutely not. Not about. Not at that time. Not in 1995. Okay. Yeah. Not, uh, because <laughs> a very funny story is that um, I insisted I, that they get real security. Uh-huh. Real cops. Okay? Not I the said, hood cops. I said, <laughs> no, 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 this is what happened. I, 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 I insisted they get real police. Uh-huh. Because I didn't want to, I said, I, I just can't do this anymore. You know, this is crazy. I come to the studio and there's all these guys and it doesn't, doesn't feel like, you know. So next time I go, there's real police, right? Way after it ends, I found that they were Rampart guys. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. I had no idea. How am I supposed to know? <laughs> you know. Yeah. And by the way, I'm not saying I'm innocent or, or guilty. I'm just saying that I, it happened. Mm-hmm. And uh, Clive couldn't do anything about Bad Boy. And mm-hmm. What are you supposed to do? People think, like, for example, there's a, someone in Congress that came to me once. And this is taking your point to the next place. Mm-hmm. And said to me, now they're 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 selling five million albums a month, something like I me, mean, ridiculous amount. Of, uh, uh, and they and remember they own the company, so they mm. get we take a distribution fee, but they're they're making the lion's share of the money. Distribution about fifteen twenty percent fee or something like it that. It was a little high, because we were promoting it, maybe mm. in twenty twenty five something okay. like that. But mm-hmm. it wasn't. But that's a lot of money on top of that, mm-hmm. a lot of money. So I don't remember the exact deal, but. Um, a congressperson came to me and said, why don't you do what McDonald's does? Why don't you pay them once a month? I said, wait, let me shake this off. <laughs> you want me to take these guys, these men who built this company, these African-American men, and you want me to put them on some kind of salary when they're making tens of millions of dollars? And what do I do with the other companies, mm-hmm. they, uh, that's how off the establishment was and how to deal with anything. This was, this was very purely guys having success, mm-hmm. getting out of control, and taking their own lives and other people's lives into their hands. This was nothing to do with music. This had nothing to do with business. This had to do with ego mm-hmm. and just out of control nonsense Mm -hmm. and a lot of people died because of that so you know i uh i don't i look back and i go how could i don't know you know i don't know i i I just don't know i mean probably everybody can point to say you should have done this you should have done that you should you know it uh every all i was ever told was hey man it's getting better yeah it's getting, it's, it's getting better. It's well, getting better. Well, it led to Dre um, launching the Aftermath. And then you look at this beautiful picture on the wall right here, your good friend. There he it, is. There it is, Marshall Mathers, you know, and that, you know, the rest is history with that success with um, Eminem. That's why we're here on Shade 4 or 5. Boom. That's right. Yeah, right? That's right. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, yeah, be nice to me. I was made the deal for this uh, this station. That the, did you? Yes. Oh, okay. All right. Well, damn, you just stunned it on Jimmy <laughs> Ivey. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna be, be nice, then. <laughs> um, Jimmy. So anyway, yeah. um, but Eminem, uh, that's his look. He has brown hair now. Yeah. Yeah. He showed up at the premiere of the um, the documentary. You see, what happened was, you know, Alan, um, Alan. Alan went in in a way that no one's ever done anything on a documentary before. As you can see, like you said, it's very truthful, very mm-hmm. straight ahead. And, you know, I want to make it clear. It's not that you don't know what's going on completely. Mm-hmm. It's just that it's got nothing to do with you. Mm-hmm. They were also in business with, hypothetically, you know, Nike. And, you know, mm-hmm. it, it, people have the wrong impression of what any label can do at that point. But you can explain it. You know what I mean? Like I we, did. Yeah. Are you kidding? Yeah. I, I played football at my house with Shug every weekend. Really? Every weekend. He'd come out with his father. Wow. wow. And we'd sit there and talk into the night and just say, guys, you have it. <laughs> All I can tell you is you have it by the tail. You know this thing called life? Mm-hmm. You have it, and just get out of the bullshit. Mm-hmm. Just get away from it. It doesn't do you any good. It only brings bad. 
Mm-hmm. And, you know, what can I say? You know, that's all you can do. You can't, you, it's their money. Yeah, yeah. So you can't control what they do. It wasn't money. my money, it was their money. Yeah. You know, they made a fortune. A fortune. It, Deservingly it, it, so. Yeah, yeah. And now it's not a whole lot to show for it. That's the that's the sad part. Again, but legacy, a lot of legacy. Well, wait a second. Yeah. Wait yeah. a second. Okay. One of them has something to show for it. Right. Okay. Which one? The doctor. The right. Dr. Dre. Right. Okay, okay. Right. I, was like, I was like, that's a trick question, Jimmy. <laughs> You're looking at me. You know the answer, Sway. <laughs> well, let's talk about Dre. and Because uh, Aftermath, it took him a second to really build. I remember he did the compilation. And, and yeah. then, and then um, but it was... That guy that really helped to catapult uh, the brand. Yeah, well, yeah. you know, the first two albums didn't do well, and yeah. and and Interscope lost a lot of money. Mm-hmm. Interscope lost like fifteen, twenty million dollars, and the and the corporation was saying, you know, maybe Dre's time is done. Why don't you move on? Your numbers will be better. And I said, yeah, as long as he moves on, as long as I can go with him, I'm yeah. I'm going. Wow. But that's how I support people. And by the way, there were things that were happening in Dre's life at that time that were dodgy. That were uncomfortable as well, mm-hmm. but you. I hoped that he would grow and get out of it. And you know something, he did. Yeah, he grew and he, got out of it. He's an incredible citizen and mm-hmm. an incredible human being, and I believe a lot of good came out of the relationships from those times, mm-hmm. right? So that there wasn't any less energy going into anyone else. Mm-hmm. The same kind of energy that went into Dre was going into everyone else. And either you have the tools, f- blessed with the tools to understand it and grasp it and, and, and get on with it, or you don't. Dre, in this documentary, the first time I ever heard him speak about and I can speak period. Speak period. Speak, <laughs> speak period. Well, I've hung out with him in the studio before, you know, and he, you know, but he, even then he's not, it's, you're not going to get a whole lot. But he spoke about what happened with D. Barnes and he he apologized, you know, profusely about yeah. what took place uh, when he uh, assaulted D. Barnes. And this has been a, and a lot of those questions came up after the movie as well. When that happened, would, were you around him when that happened? or No, I okay. didn't know him then. You didn't know him then, no. but, but did you ever comment to him about it? Or? No, I didn't. I, it, Dre and I didn't have that relationship in the very beginning. Yeah. And it was all sort of behind this death row privacy wall. Yeah. You know? And when I got to know him later on, I said, you know, that that doesn't work. Okay, <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. And... Um, and we talked about it, you know, not a lot. He doesn't like talking about stuff. Mm-hmm. That's why, even though I was not on board and originally, when Dre was willing to talk, because I knew where he was in his head, and I knew where he would go, mm-hmm. and I was very happy for him. You know, Dre just donated $10 million to Compton yeah. last week to build a school. This guy is an incredible benefit to society. Mm-hmm. You know, so when everyone talks about the stuff that, went dodgy the same effort was put into the things that went dodgy that were put into dr dre Uh and he just got and a lot of guys around him got it and and, uh doing great work look at puff yeah puff does great stuff Uh you know and should you know it's just it's just people you you, in in it's funny when you grow up like I, I grew up in Red Hook, right? Mm-hmm. You think, yep. you think that, um, you think that somebody else is responsible for your health, mm-hmm. and then when you get older, you realize you're responsible for your health. That the doctor you go see is just somebody's going to help you, yeah. but you're responsible for it, mm-hmm. and your life you're responsible for, and that's what Dre got. Dre grabbed that concept and realized. I'm responsible for my own life. Mm-hmm. And that's the Dre you see today. And it's, uh, you know, he didn't have any advantage that it, that anybody else around there at that time had. Jimmy Iovine is here, man. Uh, well, I got you, too. I had T.I. come up here. You know, and you guys have been the vanguards, the forefront of the ever-evolving uh, business of entertainment, you know, media entertainment. There's a race going on right now for content, it feels like, for videos, for audio, the whole nine. Yeah. I asked uh, T.I., who came up here, how 
what is the state of the music business and how does an artist make money and how have you seen it change? This is what he had to say. If you're an artist, you know what I'm saying, and you still just sign to that record label mm -hmm. and you you know, sign your publishing to a publishing company. Okay, they fine with that. But when you come in on some masterpiece shit and you like, nah, man, I want uh, I want a PND. <laughs> I want on my mouse. I want 85, 85, 15 split. And I don't really need your money. I just need to partake in use of your infrastructure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when, when, when niggas start getting hip to that play, okay, now we need to restructure this shit. This shit getting out of hand. So now let's Make it to where the music is free, and we're going to make them pay for the technology. It went from us working on our art and selling our art and being paid for our art as artists to now we work and give away our art, and then the person who developed this the technology yeah. is the one that gets paid. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? Mm -hmm. See, that was, you know, that, that, that was strategic. We, we, and now we must find a way to... You know, we we gotta sh we gotta shift it back. How much of that do you agree with? Well, explain it to me. What you, what, what, is, what with the context? Um, yeah. uh, how does um, the the music business has been changing now? And we yeah. were talking about the streaming sites. Yeah. And the music yeah. being offered for free. What, well, the streaming sites aren't making any money. Okay. Their margins are terrible. The, the, as you know, the you know. Uh, Apple's margins are small and Spotify's margins are small. You read about it every day. That mm -hmm. they, uh, the, the lion's share of the money goes to the labels, uh, I guess the audit, the artists and the publishers. Mm -hmm. You know, it's 70%. And these companies are very expensive to run. But what he's alluding to, first of all, Death Row owned their masters okay. and owned their company, mm -hmm. you know, along with Master P. But Death Row was absolutely one of those companies. And but what he's alluding to is, which is good for artists, is right now there are platforms where a young artist can expose himself, you know, uh, or herself, get get publicity, get known, get traction. Mm -hmm. That gives that artist a lot more leverage. Walking into if they want to go to a major, walking into a record company. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're hearing about the deals. I'm sure you do. With all these young artists getting these incredible deals, Top Dogs, New Artists, SZA, mm -hmm. um, Joyce Reyes, is that her name? Uh, Julia, what's her name? The girl from mm -hmm. Canada, Reyes. Forgot her name. Okay. Anyway, yeah. um, she's really talented. I mm -hmm. like her music, and she got a great deal at, uh, at Capital, I think. Mm -hmm. So artists with any kind of feel for the internet are uh, having a lot more leverage um but there's this whole this whole issue of free and the labels have got to join in i believe and work on this free issue because yeah. netflix doesn't have free so what ti said that really caught my attention in that statement is that artists and he's right artists are believing that there's no money in recorded music and that the money is elsewhere. Mm -hmm. That's bad for music. It's not just bad for the record business or for the artists, it's bad for music. Because mm -hmm. what happens, man, when you get into the actual art of making music, the great albums that you love, what's your favorite album of all time? Of all time? Damn. Oh, shit, man. Well, Chronic is up there. Okay. The Chronic is one of, yeah. Inner Vision, Stevie yeah. Wonder, yeah. right? Yeah, okay. okay? They were not on the road making the record. Mm -hmm. They stopped. They took a year or whatever it was to write the music, record the music, and make sure that it was incredible. A lot of artists are spending a lot less time making the records, mm -hmm. and that's going to affect the art. And that's sort of what you're feeling like, Mm. Where mm. are the records? Yeah. Yeah. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. Because if somebody so. says to you, "Here's a half a million dollars, go to Dubai," you're on that plane. Yeah. And you stop the session. You go on Dubai. You have jet lag. Come back. Your train of thought is lost. And now all of a sudden, you're not making an album anymore. You're making a bunch of songs. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's a uh, it's a dangerous thing. And a lot of that is because there there are free services that are hurting artists they really are what do you, what did you think of taylor swift's stance on 
you know, not allowing her music at one point to be, not want her music to be streamed. Well, whether she believed in streaming or not at the time, whether it was right to balance, whether it was too early, that's all her prerogative. It's her music. Mm -hmm. uh, but she's very much for artists being paid. Mm -hmm. And so am I. I owe a lot to artists, man. I, in 19, like you see in the documentary, in 1973 to 1977, I came out of Red Hook, Brooklyn, without any skills, no education. And I got a job at a studio, and John Lennon, Bruce Springsteen, and Patti Smith worked with me for some goddamn reason. Damn, you just threw all those names out there. Like, it was nothing, man. Well, that was my, it was my college education. There it is. <laughs> Live. Wow, that's a great one. Man, does that make me, give me goosebumps, man. I'll, I'll tell you, <laughs> what's great about this thing is... The guy that with the guy that did the artwork, a guy at a record company, walked in and the photo was this. Right? This was the photo. Wow. And yeah. the guy just took it and bent it and folded it. And that became the cover. Wow. Oh, wow. Right? That, that, that's, that's all he did? That's all he did. <laughs> he's, he's famous for I forgot his name, but he's famous for it. And um, and so these guys gave me my college education in taste and music and feel and how to record and why to record. The, the thing about this documentary is the question, what young people will get out of this is the why. Yeah. And what I hope they get out of it is the line of the thing about making fear a tailwind instead of a headwind. Uh -huh. Most people wake up, including myself in those days, and fear was pushing me back, yeah. stopping me. And... If you can figure out how to harness that and push you from behind, it is so, it is a power, it's as powerful as the force. Wow. <laughs> it wow. is. Yeah. And if you can get that fear, fear of failure, whatever that fear thing is, to push you and say, I can fail, I'm still cool. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and, and just keep going and you get knocked down, get up. And that's what the documentary is really about. It's yeah. about a white and a black guy comes from two racially challenged neighborhoods and get together and just keep moving. And keep moving. No matter how many things break, no matter how many times it falls down. And it shows you how we learned that in our lives as individuals and recording engineers and producers, you mm -hmm. know. But that's the that's the vibe of the documentary. The documentary is how to just take fear and get it out of the way. Get it out your system. Hmm. All right, Jimmy Ivy. Jimmy, I really wanted to ask you about, I wanted to get your POV on a conversation within the industry um, that's just been gaining so many legs over the years, and that's cultural appropriation. And the conversation has been had with Iggy Azalea at the forefront. The conversation was had just like two weeks ago when Katy Perry put out her album, um, what are your thoughts in what general? Do you mean, what happened when Katy Perry put her album out? I'm not as well. She used since she knew she was going to have a lot of attention. She used that platform to have conversations about race. Very, very sensitive conversations. Well, she, she performed on um, Saturday Night Live with Migos, and I think what kind of spurred it too is how mm -hmm. she was dancing like a rapper would and, right. and she just got a lot of backlash <laughs> on it. I love Katy Perry by, by the way, way. Yeah, I, yeah, but I, she got I, a lot I, of backlash I, I, I saw the performance <laughs> 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 alright well, you saw, know Jimmy <laughs> so, it, yeah. Okay. Yeah. so but what is the what is the help me with the issue because I've not read up a lot about this so help me with mm -hmm. this well a lot of people feel like white art artists will borrow from black culture Remix it, make it popular, but never give credit to the originators. Pat well, Boone days, kind of like Pat Boone. Well, it, it, well, again, there's Pat Boone mm -hmm. and there's Elvis Presley yeah. and there's the Beatles, and if, so not all things are the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. No one, no one talked about Little Richard, Chuck Berry, Howlin' Wolf, than the Rolling Stones and the Beatles. Mm -hmm. No one talked more about those artists. They know exactly where they got it from. They'd go visit them when they came to the States. You know what I mean? These guys were in love with those guys. Little Richard. And I think what you're talking about is right now, look, you're talking to somebody who really loves black music, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I, I, uh, I mean, I genuinely, I've always loved black music, you know, and I've been able to work on it and work with people that are fantastic. But I'm not involved in this particular conversation right now. Uh, I, um, 
you're saying that, well, you, let me ask you what you're saying. Are you saying that someone goes and gets a rapper and puts them on their record and they get success? Because that didn't start today. Somebody borrowing from the culture, acting, uh, borrowing pieces of bits of the culture yeah. and becoming the substitute of the actual person from the culture because they may be white or they may have a certain mainstream look, but mm -hmm. and not giving credit to where credit is due. So a record. What might do you be mean by I'm, I'm confused because, you know, I'm very particular pro and pro, pro black music. Right. Yes. So I, I, I have I come to this with, you know, I uh, with a lot of love for it. And I'm trying to understand the issue because I don't know. Because remember, it there was all this stuff going on in the 80s. And then all of a sudden there was Michael Jackson, mm -hmm. you know, and he was the biggest thing that ever that ever happened. So Elvis, we know Elvis was a white guy that sang that, that sang black music. Black yeah. music. And by the way, he's the first guy to say it. Yeah. Uh, but, who, who just came here and uh So I'm going I'm going back to stuff that I know. I don't know man, I don't know what Katy Perry does and what these young artists do. I'm not, uh -huh. I'm out of the record business. I've well, it's kind of, of the uh, uh not I'm, I don't know about Katy. Well, it's kind of the same thing. You got a, a lot of folks that are It's kind of like how do you separate me, inspiration and appropriation? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like somebody might have influenced me or inspired me as an artist, but I'm not stealing from them as opposed to somebody who is directly taking dance moves, singing parts and things like that and trying to make it into their own art. Well, doesn't everybody right now copy Michael Jackson? Isn't that just everybody? I mean, everything that I see that looks like somebody's moonwalking. <laughs> <laughs> but, but everybody don't get the same opportunities that are copying Michael Jackson. If you're a more mainstream or white artist, you might get more opportunity to do that kind of style of dance and singing than where it came from. Is well, what you're, you're talking to somebody whose record company was primary, uh, was sort of 60, 40, 70, 40 black music. Yeah. So I was all about promoting black music. And black. Mm -hmm. We do that at Apple Music. Mm -hmm. You know, streaming is primarily hip hop now. Yeah, and I think that Apple Music had something to do with that. Mm -hmm. You know, as far as the promotions that we were doing and the leaning into Drake and Future and all that stuff. You mm -hmm. know, so I um, I still don't understand the essence of the question. When you say appropriation, what do you mean by that? Well, essentially taking let's use a specific artist. Layman terms, yeah. Go okay, ahead. so yeah. Miley Cyrus. Um, not this effort that's coming out now where she's going back to her roots, but, you know, circa that VMA performance where she had Robin Thicke and yeah. twerking was like her go-to move. Um, but as a part of this conversation, she would never, ever mention where that initial inspiration was from. And so it kind of just looked like she was a caricature of the culture. Or Iggy. She came from Australia and she shed the accent and was kind of rapping as if she sounded like she was from the South. You know, some people probably look down on that. Yeah. And, and then uh, they reap the benefit of the culture. Yes. Well, that's that, that's been going on for yeah. an enormous amount yeah. of time. I mean, you know, African-American culture in America is absolutely one of the most underutilized underappreciated uh -huh. things about America. I mean, it's it's powerful. Yeah. It exports. Yeah. It is, you know, just awesome, you know? And so when you when you James Brown, yeah. Mick Jagger openly says, I you know, he I, there's a picture of him watching James Brown at the Tammy show. Uh -huh. And uh, which is an incredible thing if you if you're really young and you've never seen it, watch the Tammy show. And it's black music yeah. has been the genesis of music that we've seen for a very, very long time. So mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm not, I, I don't really, now the musicians that I know, for example, Bruce Springsteen, he can not talk about it. Yeah. He only talks about, I mean, Gary Bonds and, you know, James Brown yeah. and and um, Otis Redding mm -hmm. and Wilson Pickett and you know he 
constantly does. He gives that. credit where credit is this due. This is what I'm talking. Yeah, I think you're yep. talking about a younger generation yeah. that I'm not really plugged into. Okay. You know, I left Interscope three years ago, uh, so I'm not really plugged into what's going on. But the people that I know, Mick Jagger, uh -huh. Bono, we did an album called Rattle and Hum, where we made it in the South and we went on tour in the in the album in Harlem. Yeah. So, and he's done more for Africa than most people have done in a very, <laughs> very long time. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, I know musicians that only give it up. I knew John Lennon. Yeah. Oh, I mean, his top five artists are yeah. black artists and would always admit it. I've seen Paul McCartney recently and we discussed Little Richard. So the musicians that I know, I don't pay attention to these pop songs you and all yeah. this noise going around. It, it's really, I don't know, I, 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 let's just say I'm old, you know, it, uh, which I am. I'm not going to say that, Jim. I'll say it. No, I'm not going to say that. I'll, 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 wear, I'll wear that. Okay. And, um, but... I think what you're talking about is a whole new generation of stuff, and I, you know, I'm sorry, but I don't understand. I don't know their what their attitude is. I don't know what hypothetically a Katy Perry or Iggy yeah. Azalea what they do and or Miley Cyrus and what they think. I have I I'm not reading their interviews. Yeah, yeah. it's you, more systemic yeah. too. It's yeah. not it's not just them in per se. I think she's just using them as an example. But hey, listen, you're on the. The defiant ones now. So let's let's get back to the yeah, defiant. Yeah, but I think that's a. I, but I really like her question. I think yeah. that's a really good question because mm. in my generation, it was all about the blues. Yeah, and it was all you know, it was all about that uh -huh. to me. But anyway, um, but the defiant ones is about that. It's about that breaking through, like yeah. we know with with the with the chronic, and um, I mean. It, we were held back. This, you know something? This was actually a very good lead-in question because part of what the Defiant Ones is about, and when you see Snoop talk about the cover of Rolling Stone, yeah. at Interscope Records, we were going to do everything we can. Because remember, in the 50s, black music didn't travel. So mm. what happened was all these young English guys picked it up and took it. And yeah. ran with it. Uh -huh. What we did was we spent a fortune on hip hop, on aggressive hip hop. Let's call it aggressive, okay? okay. Uh -huh. And we said, I remember saying to my staff one day, I said, they are going to be dancing this record in China. I promise you. Because they told me they couldn't get it on the radio in America. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. what we did, which is in the doc as well, is we took one minute of G Thing. Yeah and spent a fortune on buying one minute ads without any introduction or any out or any mention of the record. But just at the end it said, G Thing by Dr. Dre, Snoop Dogg. And that caused, then I went to MTV. Uh -huh. And I went to MTV and I said, I want you to play this music during the day. They said, we can't play this during the day. I said, yes, you can. He said, where can we play it? I said, play next to Guns N' Roses. It's every bit as aggressive. It's every bit as cr credible. And it's got. It's every bit as good uh, as Guns N' Roses. Play if you can play Guns N' Roses, you can play the Chronic. And I, I had some credibility with the guys from my producing career. I said, I'll tell you what. If it doesn't work, I will never come up to this office again. Wow. So, that is what you're talking about at a corporate level. So. Yeah. I believe Dre was very influential and Snoop and, Br and Pac in bringing hip hop to the rest of the world. Uh -huh. You know, African American, uh, American hip hop, uh -huh. you know? And um, so I feel, I feel good about that. You feel good about that. Right? Well, you, as you should. Yeah. I mean, um, I, you know, just to be transparent, you, you even um, King Tech and I had a production deal with, Interscope Records after we would have him on the show for a long time and groups like Jurassic um, 5 and mm -hmm. Planet Asia at that time. You did it with Tom, right? Yeah, Tom we, did, we did it with Tom Wally. So I was under that uh, Interscope umbrella and in terms of creativity, there was never a wall, you no. know, that, that prevented us from putting out, you know, the projects that we put out. And we, 
I, I had a record company call me after we made the chronic video. I think I spent $300,000 or something like that or on the Dre Day video. I had a label call me the Antichrist. He said, because these videos are supposed to cost $20,000. Uh -huh. So I said, why is his video different than, you know, Kurt Cobain's video? I didn't understand. So we just opened the vault and promoted that stuff like crazy and uh -huh. that's that's why we got thrown out of time warner because when that music hit top 40 radio and hit mtv uh -huh. senators and congressmen and people like william bennett's kids started bringing the music home yeah they start bringing it to their parents house, yeah. right? yeah and then that's when the whole thing in the documentary in episode three uh -huh. explodes and they tell me to get rid of death row they offered me $150 million to get rid of death row. Time Warner did. Yes. Yes. It, it, and I said, no. You're out of your mind. I'm not doing this. No. It was very risky. Because uh -huh. at the time, no one would knew if they would even take us at another label. Because there was a lot of violence, a lot of weird stuff around. Oh, but yeah. I said, no, because I'm very committed to black music. Uh -huh. Just that simple. And uh, I... I not all artists agree with me. There are artists that have been on Interscope that feel that it's our fault that they failed or succeeded, but that's always going to happen at labels. What was Interscope's commitment to the black community? Well, what do you mean by that? Like, I mean, the the black music, you know, made, was very profitable, you know. Yeah. Um, did it ever get reinvested into the community, you know, recreation center? You the know, fact that it was, we, it, did, we did small stuff, but not enough. Not enough. I cop to that. Not yeah. enough. You know, I gotta be honest with you. We it was like Vietnam in a scope. Yeah. We weren't thinking about. <laughs> Y'all were thinking. We weren't thinking about anything except for keeping the place alive because everybody's trying to shut us down, and mm -hmm. it was uh, it was a mess. But I'm thrilled to see that you know I support anything that Dre does. Yeah. You know, and it's a big part of my life. Uh -huh. You know, and uh, my, my going forward, it's a big part of, because I think what's going on, unfortunately, right now is uh, there are some shades of, talk about shade 45, there's some shades of it getting worse. Uh -huh. But Interscope could have done more. Uh, Interscope was a, like a rocket ship out of control. Uh -huh. We ran that place, it almost felt like a circus. So, so how is Beats different from Interscope? Well, Beats is very different than Interscope. Yeah. Because there are no artists involved. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you see this thing right here? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you the difference. Uh -huh. Okay, Beats, you stay right there. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. Okay? Mm -hmm. That's the difference between Beats and Interscope. There's uh -huh. no artist. <laughs> there's no artist. So there's no, nothing's moving. Uh -huh. And so we create it with Beats, and you see, again, in the documentary, is that Dre and I were frustrated with audio, you know? And um, so we, um, we wanted, we felt headphones were very, very sterile sounding because they were made for reference and stuff. And we, f and we also felt that they were like medical equipment, uh -huh. you know? Um, so we went on a mission to try to change Young people, young people are only being introduced to audio based on the earbuds that come with a phone. So you spend months in a studio trying to get something to sound good, and you're trying to hear it through something that big. So everybody said to me, but no one will buy big headphones. I said, if we make them cool, they will buy big headphones. And there were, I'll tell you, there were, five partners on beats mm -hmm. and it was me dre lebron will i am and luke wood mm -hmm. those were the five guys at the beginning of beats if i'm, if I'm leaving somebody out i completely f uh, forgive me but uh where was monster at at that time monster was our distributor okay monster was our distributor and Again, we owned the brand. We owned Beats by Dre. That's what was important to me. They made seventy. They made a big piece of the money. Yeah, more than we did. But we brought this design was done by Robert Bruner that we brought to the table. Mm -hmm. So um, they did. They really helped with the sound because I look. I like Noel. I know Lil Sudas and he's 
gone on and on and on, uh, you know, uh, about it. But I always liked Noel. I always felt he made a fortune. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. he made a fortune. And then they just sued us. So I can't really talk about those things. But, you know, I think I think the case is over. But I'm not sure. I, think I love that you don't even know. <laughs> Jimmy is like, I think the case is over. Um, <laughs> that's great. I'm, I'm seeing a lot of... Um, you know, I know Larry Jackson is over there, good yeah. friend of mine. Yeah. Um, and I've seen a lot of the projects that are coming out, including the Defiant Ones and, you know, these docu-series on different artists. What's the future, do you think, for you guys? For Apple Music? Yeah. Apple Music, all music services need to be of service, you know, and uh, meaning that we have to do more than be a utility because I think, I think all this free music is it's just too the technology is too good and people are saying why should i pay for this stuff so mm-hmm. that we have to become better at servicing the audience mm-hmm. at discovery at interaction with their artists be better for the artist you know and you know where we're coming from we larry and i i mean the, the the deal that larry made with drake was game changing for um for streaming uh-huh. it really was it took everybody a lot of everybody but a lot of people if you look at the top 20 in spotify and in apple uh-huh. a lot of it is black music and uh-huh. hip-hop uh-huh. A, most of it what can you tell us about the deal like this and how it was structured that made it so unique the, uh, the, the larry and um the deal that larry did with drake Larry saw something that was interesting. He felt, he saw Drake's and Future the Prince ability to move culture and to, they really understood. Like if I was, if I still had Interscope, mm-hmm. I'd make Drake and Future the Prince, the president, the president, and the president. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay, mm-hmm. I'd put, I they would be, Across the board, they're some of the smartest people in promoting and marketing and understanding how music flows mm-hmm. in this century. And he spotted that, and we made a deal where he would put his records out, leak them instead of leaking them um, for free on stuff. He would leak them through, leak them or put them out through us. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was a very insightful deal, and uh, I backed him a thousand percent. And he um, and and Drake and Future the Prince are stand up guys. Yeah, man. those yeah. guys are incredible mm-hmm. people. So you know that's the deal. The deal is that we just brought them in and said, okay, what do you need? Mm-hmm. And you know, yeah, was there a lot of money? Yes, but so what? So does LeBron make a lot of money? Let me. Uh, this will be the final. And Drake question. scores as many points <laughs> as LeBron does, right? <laughs> Got as many rings. Um, Jay Z started title, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, I think we all been proud of him and the moves he's made yeah. as he's navigated uh, through this business. And with title being a, uh, a valid competitor in this streaming game, what can what are your thoughts about Jay? Do y'all communicate at all, or, or just a, about a, a lot? Okay. I, I, every every Saturday morning, I go through the real estate age real estate uh, books, and I uh, send him a house that he should buy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. And uh, if you ever get Jay on here, ask him. Okay, all right. Uh, I'm I'm his best real estate agent. Okay. So, because um, I know he's looking for a house out there, and I I tried to help a few times, and uh, I I wanted them to come over to Apple Music, but he felt he wanted to do it on his own, and the Sprint deal is a good deal for him, mm-hmm. you know, and. I what when he first started to be completely frank. I looked at him. I said, "I got to tell you something. I just had Beats Music. This is a tough model to go alone. We can't do it alone. We have to go to Apple because uh-huh. the margins are too small. The labels and the publishers and the artists they get most of the money. Yeah. So when you're trying to run a streaming service, as you see with Spotify, etc. The losses are hundreds of millions of dollars." Uh-huh. Right, so I think in the deal he's in right now, you have Sprint taking up a lot of that heat, yeah. and I think that's good for him. Uh-huh. You know, but it's a it's a tough, 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 tough business to start. Jimmy Ivey, man, if you wow. ever back in New York, man, come back. Let's do part two, man. 
Well, it's uh, you know, it's uh, it's it's a great. You guys are incredible. First of all, the fact that you're on Shea Forty Five means so much to me. Paul Rosenberg. Yes. This was Paul Rosenberg's idea, Scott Greenstein, and oh. they just came to me. And I, I, I don't know. I did something. I don't remember what I did. <laughs> <laughs> I helped a little bit. You know what I mean? I'm not sure exactly how much we helped, but, but we helped. Yeah. And uh, I'm glad. And you guys are doing great, which is fantastic. Yeah, you yeah. know, but I... I, I, I kind of like what this young woman was talking about before because I wasn't aware of that. I'm going to look look at that. Yeah. I, I'm going to look at that because it's not where I come from. You know, my whole thing is about, you know, my my playlist is Sam Cooke, Otis Redding. Yeah. You know, the Rolling Stones are the same one. But where I come from and the people that I work with get it completely. And, yeah. you know, I, I and remember, I... I the minute Death Row walked in my office, I said, "I got to tell you, something, guys, something. You own this company. We don't." Wow. And well, that's how we started. Do you still talk with Sugar at all? No, he, oh. he can't. He's in prison. Yeah. You know, I I ran into him about I don't know five years ago, and it was very, it was polite. Yeah. It wasn't uh, his thing. I don't know. I, I again. How do you stop that? That's yeah. a, uh, that's that's an individual, man. Mm-hmm. How do you stop that? That that's got nothing to do with. That's not in anybody's control. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, it it was it was in everyone's interest for Suge to do great. Everybody. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And what happened is a tragedy. It's a tragedy, and we lost one of the greatest of all time, too. Biggie, two. two. Big impact. Two, yeah. Two over what looked to me like bullshit. Yeah. Yeah. That's how it looked to a lot of folks. Um Jimmy Iveen, ladies Ooh. and gentlemen. Better, man. And that's Tracy G right there. So you remember her name. Tracy Pleasure G. meeting you, Jimmy. Okay. Tracy G. Uh and we want to thank uh Donnie Wahlberg for coming by, Steve Aoki for coming by, the Colony album. You could get that on pre order. Uh, Jimmy, you want to give out your social media? Or you don't do that. I don't. I don't have any social media. Good, Good for you, for you bro. Live your you, life. Man. You know, yeah, I, don't, I don't have any social media because I don't want to see how great everybody's life is, and I'm like, oh my god, I'm sitting here miserable. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's like wonder. <laughs> all right, uh, all right. We want to thank y'all for tuning in. I'm at Real Sway across the board. Tracy can be reached where? Yo, citizens, find me Twitter, Instagram, easy at it's Tracy G I T S her A C Y G. DB, it's really. DB everywhere. Wonder. At DJ Wonder, I'll be miserable today. OQ. I am OQ on Instagram. All right. I am OQ on Instagram. All right, we got an ugly guy coming by tomorrow, so oh, uh, make shoot. sure you tune in and tell them we have nothing. <laughs> it's Sway in the morning. Only. On Shade 45. Kill <laughs>